and uh, keep them coming. It's a great thing to hear your voice and uh, to have that a cappella moment. I think it's wonderful. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? But it's always a good day, an extra good day when Addie sings on the praise team. And I mean that. I really appreciate that young lady and using the gift of music that God has given her. Where is she? <laughs> Does the speakers work in the bathroom? Addie, love you. Oh, my, oh, my. Um, I think, uh, where's Mr. Owens? Is he in the bathroom too? <laughs> Is he with the kids? So, all right. Well, Nick, if you can hear me, I thought I heard my son during children's story. I thought, Toby, I heard you wonder whether or not it's possible for your mom and dad to produce a baby elephant. So I don't know if you've had that level of biology in school yet, but I'm going to hope that Mr. Owens can explain that to you a little bit better. <laughs> well, what do you think I'm going to talk about today? I'll give you three guesses. Okay, it's on there. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, that we can celebrate together today, that we can enjoy the time of fellowship, that we can worship, lift our voices, and have your spirit and the promises that you bring here in our midst with us. I just pray that you would uh, dedicate and bless this time as we get into the message. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I, I probably have not spoken on the topic of moms every Mother's Day weekend um, since being a pastor, but I, I would say probably the vast majority of them I have. Um, I think it's fine to at least once a year dedicate time to acknowledging the spiritual benefits and teachings and illustrations of moms in the Bible, and I think it's very important. Now, I know we have a lot of moms here. We gave some, some flowers out, and I know we have some grandmas. Do we have any great grandmas here? Do we have any great grandmas? We do have a great grandma. Very good. Okay, do we have any great, great? I'm kind of looking because if we only have one great, it can only go one direction. No great greats? All right. Well, uh, it's a great thing to be a great grandma as well as a grandma. I have one remain. I have a, a lot of wonderful women in my life. And uh, my, my wife, of course, who's the mother to my children, had a, I have a great mom. I almost said had in the past tense. I have a great mom. She'll be here in a couple of weeks for Timree's graduation. Uh, my maternal grandmother passed away, but she was just an angel to me, just could not picture a more wonderful grandmother. I have one remaining grandmother, my grandma Virginia. Next month, she'll be 95, I think. Does that make sense? She is a great, great grandma. Hi, Addie. My grandmother is a great, great grandmother. She has two great, great grandchildren. I always thought that must be an interesting psychology when, as a parent, your grandchild becomes a grandparent. Can you imagine that? Your grandchild, because that's what a great, great grandmother is. Their grandchild is now a grandparent. Now, there was a time when that was a little more common than it is today, but it's getting more and more rare these days. So I want to talk about moms and grandmas today, if that's all right with you. I like this little note from uh, the book, You Shall Receive Power. The seeds sown in infancy by the careful, God-fearing mother will become trees of righteousness which will blossom and bear fruit. Very reminiscent of the Proverbs that Gina mentioned, train up a child in the way they should go. You know, and when they are old, they shall not depart from it. Now, that, that verse, it doesn't always mean when we th what we think it means, but the application and, and the, the idea behind it is very wonderful. And you have this similar sentiment here. The seed sown in infancy, and I highlighted that word for a reason. I underlined it. I put it in there. I want you to keep in mind, it doesn't say the seed sown in childhood or the seed sown when young. It says in infancy, by the careful God-fearing mother, will become trees of righteousness which will blossom and bear fruit. I like the imagery. I like the idea, idea here. So now I want to talk to the kids today and do a little kids quiz about moms in the Bible. 
We're going to use the blue. And Toby, you, are you here for me? You and your baby elephant story. All right, young people, I like to interact kind of here at the beginning of my messages to get into the story, get into the message. Do you know this one? Who was Moses' mother? Mom, Dad, you can help out if any of the young people need some help. All right, we have some, some people back here, some young people ready to help out. Marianne? No, that was his sister. So you got one lady in his life. Jacobet. I saw you working on it, and it, you got it. Jacobet is right. Antonio, have you ever heard of Jacobet before? <laughs> Currently up at Camp Yavapais. <laughs> so in a way, Moses had two moms, though. Jacobet was his Hebrew mother, but he did have an adoptive uh, Egyptian mother, and we think her name was Bithia. Her, her name is in the Bible, um, probably Bithia. So he did, for 40 years, he lived in Egypt, and, and Bithia was mom, and, and uh, so that's interesting. He had a, a mom and kind of a, an adoptive mom, you might say. All right, question now. You need to use your thinking, if you remember some of the Bible characters. Joseph of the Old Testament, okay, who was his grandma? All right, I see some young people over here, man. They're just ready to go. I, I don't want to leave anyone out on the other sides of the, the church. So grandma to Joseph. Sarah? Oh, my. Very, very good guess. Not quite right. That would be great, Grandma. All right, I see Caleb back here or up front here. Right here. Rebecca? Ah, is she right? It, no? <laughs> did, I, did I get that one wrong? It's not impossible for me to. It's Rebecca, isn't it? Joseph's mother was Rachel, and Rachel's husband was Jacob, and Jacob's parents were Isaac and Rebecca. By the way, we don't have as much biblical information about Rebecca as we do some of the other ladies of the story, but what we do have about her is fascinating. I'm looking forward to meeting Rebecca someday. Rebecca was a dynamite lady in the Bible. Looking forward to meeting her. All right, another one. Who's David's great-grandma? Uh, this is going to take some, uh, some young Bible scholars. Uh, Caleb, you want to, Vitor, you, are you ready to go on this one? You're going to work on it? Talk to mom a little bit maybe? Oh, I pressured him. I pressured him. I know I did. Go ahead, Caleb. A. You are so right. It is Ruth, isn't it? Ruth, that Moabite. You know, we have the whole Bible book of Ruth. She wasn't a Hebrew, but she, she loved her mother-in-law and, and uh, says, where you go, I shall go. Your God shall be my God. And there's a great story between Ruth uh, and, uh, and the story. So she is great-grandma to King David. Number four. All right, this is kind of one you're just going to have to guess at maybe. But the word grandmother, does it appear in the Bible? How many times do you read the name or the word grandma in the Bible? Well, you throw your hand up like you know. You're just like, oh, I know. Just, it's all right. <laughs> All right, I see a couple of heads. Okay, I see a Don in the back. We want to give some other young people a chance. A Don's, but he's ready to go. Three. Three? No. It's not three. I was just playing with you, Don. It's a good guess. And yet this is one that you probably just have to guess. I, I wouldn't have known if I hadn't looked it up before. So another one up front here. Zero. Zero? No, that's wrong. <laughs> Kind of concentrated. Oh, we have Julian and Kay up here too. So let's give a chance over here. One. All right, we have a one, but I want to hear what Julian has to say too. Thank you, young man. I really appreciate your help here. We wouldn't know what to do without you. Julian. Two. Two. So we've heard almost all of them, but the answer was correct over here. It doesn't appear in the Bible just once. Not only the name or the word grandmother, but we know her name too, Lois. Her name is Lois. So the next question is going to be about that. If we know grandma's name, what was her grandson's name? Who was Lois's grandson? Last, last one, just part of our trivia here, part of the message. Paul, Peter, Silas, Barnabas, or Timothy. Who is Lois's grandson? All right, I see Caleb's hand. Got some young people over here. Caleb. D. 
D, Barnabas, close but not correct. <laughs> Kenneth, don't laugh at your brother, all right? He's Timothy? trying. Who did you say? Timothy. Timothy, are you guessing or do you know? Because you got it right. It is Timothy. We know Timothy's grandma's name. Her name is Lois. It doesn't even sound very Hebrew-y, does it? And by the way, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Yes, grandmother, the word grandmother only appears once in the Bible. But that is a bit of a misnomer because so much of the Bible is Hebrew, and there is no word for grandmother or grandfather in Hebrew. They, the, the word father and mother is just synonymous with every generation. If your, grandma, if your grandfather is Joe, you don't call him grandfather. You just say, Father Joe. Or if your grandmother is, is Helen, you wouldn't call her grandmother. You just say she's Mother Helen. That was my, my grandma's, my maternal grandmother's name is Helen. So I just chose it for that. So there wasn't really a name. But in, in the New Testament, uh, they do use the word. And thank you, Toby. That, that was the end of the, the kids' time. Um, is Lois. Grandmother Lois. Here it is. I thank God. This is Paul writing, the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy, it's his last uh, writing, okay, he's about to die, and he writes to Timothy, and he says this, I thank God, right in the beginning verses, whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you, Timothy, in my prayers night and day, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwell in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. Paul applauds, Paul acknowledges, Paul celebrates the origin and the, the, the source of Timothy's faith. He says, I, and he seems to speak of these ladies like he knows them, and we'll talk about that in just a minute too, but he says, I know that this great thing that God has done in you, that, that, that your mother and your grandmother were the ones that helped contribute to that. Uh, Eunice's name in Greek is Unica. Uh, I think that's a cool name too. Um, and then Lois. And so these two ladies' names appear in Scripture. We don't know a lot about them. There's a couple other very brief mentions of them or allusions to them in the writings of Paul or in the New Testament in the book of Acts. But yet it's very, very interesting. I don't want you to miss this point. We know the names of Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, where there are many other very, very significant women in the Bible that we don't know their names. When the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write the book of 2 Timothy, when the Spirit of God was working upon Paul to write this very important, very delicate, and very uh, 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 weary message to Timothy, God inspires him, write the names of Lois and Eunice. Just think about this for a second. We don't know the name of the woman at the well. We don't know her name. We don't know the name of the woman who reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. We don't know her name. We don't know the name of the, uh, of the widow who gave the two mites. We don't know the name of the widow of Nain whose son was resurrected by Jesus. There are all kinds of very wonderful and important stories of the Bible involving women where we don't know their name. And there's reasons, historical and other reasons, why, why their names may or may not have appeared in Scripture. But for some reason, God wanted us forever enshrined in Scripture to know the names of these ladies. And I just think that's worthy of note. We don't, if you go into the Old Testament, think about this for a second. We don't know the name of a single lady that was on, on Noah's Ark. Did you know? We don't know their names. They are all our mothers, right? They, I mean, we are related to, to Noah and to his sons and, and the, 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 uh, the daughters-in-law, but not one of their names is mentioned. We don't even know the names of the women on the ark. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit said these two ladies' names are going to be written down in Scripture, enshrined in sacred writ for our observation and acknowledgement even to the end of time. We know their names. It was significant to Paul. It was significant to the Holy Spirit that we should analyze and look at what the uh, meaning and message is of Eunice and Lois. You see in this picture, just a, a 
an artist picture. I didn't draw this. This is just, you know, from, from looking at it. This is dad over here. He doesn't look like a Hebrew, does he? And he's worshiping at a, a pagan shrine because he was a Greek. He was not a believer in Jesus. He was, he was not um, a Jew. He was a Greek. So Timothy's father um, was not a believer in the, in the Scriptures or the God of the Bible or in Jesus Christ. So here is one of the first passages where we meet Timothy. We're going to uh, talk about Timothy for a second um, because we know more about him. Paul came also to Derba and to Lystra. This is Acts chapter 16. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Okay? And so this is the way that the Bible writer is expressing the dynamic of, Timi of Timothy's family. Okay, this is not just about ethnicity. This is also about religious distinction. Not only was his father a Greek, uh, the uh, author of Acts, Luke, he changes the tense when he talks about um, Timothy's father to indicate that he was also dead. So Timothy's father, not only was he a Greek and a pagan, at this time he's probably also dead. So Paul comes into the city of Lystra in Acts chapter 14, he does a miracle. He and Barnabas do a miracle in Lystra. And the community there gets so excited, they start um, wanting to offer offerings to, to, Luke, uh, to, um, to Paul and Barnabas, and they start calling them by pagan god names. Do you remember this story? Zeus and Hermes. They said, oh, the gods must be upon, among us because you've performed a miracle. And they begin to offer things. And, and Paul is horrified by the fact you've missed, the, you've missed the point. I'm not here to represent Zeus. I'm here to represent Jesus Christ. And he causes such a, it causes such a stir. It causes such a problem that the community gets, first of all, they're worshiping them as gods. Well, then they get upset with them with, with what they say. So then they stone Paul and Barnabas. They stone Paul to the point that they thought he was dead. It says they dragged dragged his body out of the city thinking he was dead. This is the city of Timothy. Okay? Somewhere, somehow in the story, after Paul's body is dragged, bruised and bleeding, they thought he was dead, out of the city, um, at some point, Timothy, and probably mom at least, Eunice, maybe Lois as well, came and tended to the broken body of Paul. That was the first meeting of Paul and Timothy. Timothy as a young boy attending to the broken and bruised dying body of Paul. All right? That's where Timothy enters into the story of Paul. And so later on you you pick up the story and Paul or here Luke again I'm I'm switching between books here for a second. Luke the author here tells us a little bit about the background of Timothy. He's got a Jewish mom who's a believer now, that doesn't just mean a believer in the, the Old Testament Scriptures. It means a believer in Jesus. So at some point in the ministry of Paul, maybe even at that moment in Lystra, as Paul was declaring the truth about Jesus Christ, a spark was lit up in Lois and in Eunice, and they accepted Jesus Christ as the true Messiah. And they began to teach Timothy the same thing. So by the time we come to chapter 16, um, she is called a believer. Timothy is a disciple and his mother is called a believer, despite the fact that his father did not raise him to be Jewish, did not raise him to accept the teachings of the Old Testament. Just a few other little biological, or biographical, excuse me, biographical things that we know about Timothy. His name is very special. It means one who honors God. So even though his father is Greek, he allows a Jewish name, or at least a, a name, it's a Greek name, but a name mentioning and honoring God is what uh, he is named, one who honors God. Now, naming, names in the Bible are very significant. It's interesting that Timothy has this name because among many of the disciples, their names are also uh, uh, significant. One of them that I would just point out is Andrew. Peter's brother, Andrew, has a Greek name, not a Hebrew name. Andrew is not Hebrew. It is Greek. So it's made many people wonder if maybe Peter and Andrew also had a Greek father. Why would Andrew have a Greek name? Just uh, something to think about. Again, not, not to put any pressure on. Um, we know he was young. He's called young. The, the word that is used in the Greek means probably someone under the age of 30 when he at least meets and begins to do his ministry with Paul. He had a mixed heritage, which we've talked about. He was not circumcised. His father, Greeks hated circumcision. They thought it was horrendous. 
despite the fact they're doing all kinds of horrendous things in their, in their religion as well. But uh, mm-hmm. Timothy is not circumcised as having a Greek father. That would be very normal to not allow that to happen. This is why Paul decides to have Timothy circumcised later, and that story is very interesting. Um, from what Paul seems to talk about Timothy, he seemed to be a little shy. Paul's constantly telling him to be bold. Trust in what God has done in you. Trust what you've been told. Trust what you've learned growing up. Uh, he seemed to be somewhat timid. He seemed to be somewhat... Uh, shy, and he also tended to be somewhat sickly. There's several references to Timothy about him having constant uh, uh, issues with his health, and so uh, that's just what we would get, uh, gain from the Scriptures. And again, I mentioned his father most likely had died by this time. Paul and Timothy have a very special relationship in Scripture, very unique. Um, Paul calls him my true child, my beloved son, He had a lot of people that had come to Christ, and he has very endearing, very affirming titles for all kinds of believers, but he reserves some very special titles for Timothy, my true child, my beloved son. He said in Philippians, I have no one like him, no one like him that I can trust. He says he's like a child serving his father. He really adopts Timothy as his spiritual son. He uses very familial language whenever he's referring to Timothy. And just keep in mind, when he's about to die, he's got one more letter that he can write. There's one person on his mind that he wants to write to, Timothy. And several times in 2 Timothy, he asks him, I hope that you can come soon. I want you to come soon. I want to see you one more time. Almost like a father saying, I know that my time is coming. If I could just see my son one more time, that would be a blessing to me. So he has a very special relationship with Paul. Timothy in the New Testament. Now you say, well, I thought we started with moms and grandmas. Why are we spending so much time uh, talking about Timothy? Well, Timothy is the result of the faith and the investment of mom and grandma. So I thought we would just celebrate Timothy for a while because most moms like it when their kids are, uh, are honored and celebrated. We'll come back to them in a second, but it's important to understand the context. Timothy, I don't know if you realize this, Timothy participates in or contributes to the writing of at least six of Paul's epistles. Paul begins six epistles. I, Paul, and Timothy with me write to you. I, Paul, here, you know, in Galatia or, or, you know, in one of the other books, and Timothy. Timothy is present working, contributing, in some way supporting, even if he's just the scribe, the work of Paul. He is intensely invested in the writing of Scripture itself. Timothy is mentioned in 11 New Testament epistles. His name is there. He ministers in Berea, Corinth, Athens, Thessalonica, Macedonia, Galatia, others. He's doing very significant ministry and missionary and pastoral work in the very areas that Paul and the early apostles were as well. We know at least one time he's jailed for his faith. And he becomes the pastor of one of the most significant churches in the ancient world, in Ephesus. He becomes the spiritual leader of a massive region of people in Asia Minor. Timothy is a highly significant New Testament character. It's hard to imagine what the New Testament or what the development of the early church would have been without Timothy. And sometimes we kind of just push him off to the side. Oh yeah, there's a couple books called Timothy, and there's this guy, he did some good things. He's central to the New Testament story. Without Timothy, so much of the biblical record would be different or not as we see it today. Of course, God has his ways of making his his plan accomplished. He would have found someone, but the person that he found in this case is Timothy. A few more things. I like this from Acts of the Apostles. The Holy Spirit found in him one who could be molded and fashioned as a temple for the indwelling of the divine spirit or the divine presence. In the Bible commentary, it says, in the history of Timothy are found precious lessons so fixed were his principles by a correct education that he was fitted for this important position. Over and over, this is from Barclay's commentary, over and over again, Paul's voice vibrates with affection when he speaks of Timothy. Timothy was the man whom Paul could trust and could send anywhere knowing he would go. Timothy is our example of how we should serve in the faith Christ and his church need servants like Timothy. Christ and his church need servants like that. Where did Timothy get such faith? Where did Timothy get such a foundation that would make him strong in the Lord? Where did he get his faith? Well, we know this. We introduced it to you earlier. 
Why do we need to know Lois and Eunice's names? Why was it important for the Holy Spirit to record and inspire that their names? Because they were the prime movers in the establishment of one of the greatest Christian leaders of the early church. And God celebrates that. God honors the ministry of the mothers and grandmothers who pour their lives into their children and grandchildren. You, however, this is another one of those uh, inferences to Timothy's upbringing. Again, 2 Timothy here, chapter 3. Paul speaking to Timothy. You, however, continue in the things you have learned. Now, Paul will take some credit for this because Timothy worked with Paul. So Paul will tell Timothy, remember the things that I have taught you. Remember the persecutions that we've been through together. Remember how we have suffered and we've done things together. So this is not totally devoid. Uh, Paul is not totally uh, separating himself from the education of Timothy. But notice what he says. Continue in the things you have learned and have become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. He's reminding Timothy Remember the source of your faith. Remember from where it came from. Yes, the Holy Scriptures, we know that's true. But in verse 15, he says this, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. From childhood you've known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom which leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now keep in mind this. The sacred writings that Timothy knew was not the New Testament. The New Testament wasn't quite all together and written yet. The sacred writings that gave Timothy the faith that he could have salvation through Jesus Christ was the Old Testament. Timothy saw Jesus even in the Old Testament. And that's what Jesus wanted. When he came uh, to earth and walked around as, as as the Jewish rabbi, he says, if you've seen Moses, if you've read Moses, then you should know me. If you know the prophets, then you should know me. Everything that they wrote was about me. So Jesus is in the Old Testament. Amen? I think over here I heard some good amens. I'm worried about this side over here. Jesus is in the Old Testament. Eh, It's a little better. We've got some balance at least. So Timothy had been studied and lectured and exposed to the truth of who God was so that when he saw Jesus in Paul, when Paul came to Lystra and he was teaching about the wisdom and mercy and work of, of, of God through the man Jesus Christ, a spark was lit in the heart of Timothy. He says, that must, Jesus then must be that Messiah that Moses had talked about. Jesus must be that Messiah that the prophets had been pointing us to. He saw Jesus Christ in Paul because he knew the Scriptures. And we should know the Scriptures as well. But there is a part of this I want to draw your attention to for just a moment. It's this part where he says, and from childhood. From childhood. Now, I tried to illustrate this. We'll see how well I have did. Paul uses a word here, Greek word. It's brephos, brephus, okay, when he says childhood. But it doesn't mean childhood. It doesn't mean that at all. It is traditionally translated in most modern translations as as a child or from childhood. But look how it's translated other places in the Bible. You remember this story? When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby, that's Brephus, the baby leapt in her womb. That's not childhood. (laughs) That's not a child. That is a fetus. Okay? Okay. It doesn't just mean that. Here's another place. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby, brephus, wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. How old was Jesus at this time? He's not, he's a baby. He's not a child, he's a baby. Here's another place where this word is used. Peter says, like newborn brephus, babies, long for the pure milk of the word. Does Paul know the Greek language very well? Do, do you know your, your Bible history? Was he, was he a smart guy when it came to Greek? He was a very highly educated person. When he wants to use the word child, he's very capable of doing that. In 1 Corinthians, in the love chapter, when he says, when I was a child, I used to think as a child, I would reason as a child and speak as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. He uses the Greek word for child. He knows the word for child or for childhood. In 2 Timothy, he does not use the word child. He uses the word 
for infant or newborn or even unborn. Now, there are some translations that have made this adjustment. The NIV, which I, I use the New American Standard for the most part, um, and I like to, I, I'm not married to it. I look at other translations as well. Uh, the NIV is one of the modern translations that goes back to using infancy. From infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, there is a difference, friend, this morning between these words. There is a difference in what Paul meant when he said, Timothy, you have known these things from being a baby or you've known these things from being a child. Now, I want to say two quick things about this because I don't want to beat you up or, or, or beat up the Bible translators very much. There's reasons why most Bible translators, including the King James and, and the New American Standard and the Living Bible and, and uh, many others still use the word childhood. There's a couple of reasons. One, they reason that in a Jewish formal setting, it's age five that a boy begins his education. So they reason that Paul said baby, Paul said infant, but they say he couldn't have meant that. He must, because an infant doesn't learn at, at when they're born or a baby. An infant, no, 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 no. He must have meant a child, and so we're going to say childhood. So they reason that when they make their translation. But there's another likely reason why they're hesitant to use the word infant, and it's simply this. Most Bible translators and scholars are men. They just are. And so they don't know what it's like to have a baby in their womb. They don't know what that's like. And they have not, you know, asked their spouses or their wives, is it really possible that when the baby was in your womb, it was learning and hearing? They're just using their masculine perspective and saying it must have been a child. Paul said baby, but he must have meant a child. And I think partly it's because just historically it's more men that have done translation and Bible scholarly work than women. And that's not meant to be a gender smash or, or slam or anything. I just think it's a, a part of the historical development of the Scriptures. I want you to see how Eugene Peterson translates this. I don't use the message a lot. It's a paraphrase. It's, it's a single translation and, and done with purposeful uh, flair to it. But I thought this one was interesting. I want you to see how the message Bible translates this. He says, Timothy, you took in the sacred Scriptures with your mother's milk. Now that is direct. That is, that is, you know, cutting right to it and saying, from the moment you were being nourished by your mother, she was also nourishing you with God's holy word. I kind of thought, I kind of like that though. I mean, it creates a very uh, interesting thought and image. What's the, what's the point of all this? I think Paul was emphasizing and celebrating the fact that Lois and Eunice began teaching Timothy from the moment he had life. Do you know that the unborn can tell their mother's voice? The unborn can recognize their mother's voice. It's hard to get this type of research in America because of the politics and the emotions of abortion and, and the, the, the dynamics of understanding what's going on in the womb versus what's not going in the womb. But throughout the rest of the world, Australia, Finland, Denmark, Germany, Israel, uh, Russia, China, studies all over the place. There was one just recently, well, recent if you consider 2003 recent, a study out of Russia where they did amazing research, uh, and, and you can read all about this. It was in ABC News. It was published in American media where they did very dynamic tests and studies of women uh, in, in, with late-term babies proving that that baby could identify their mother's voice amongst a cacophony of other voices. That baby's heartbeat would pick up. That baby would kick. That baby would acknowledge when they heard mom's voice. Not someone else's voice, mom's voice. From infancy, from the moment you were conceived within Eunice, she was teaching you. Did any of you talk to your bellies when you were pregnant? None of you did, or you're just kind of embarrassed. Did you start telling them the nursery rhymes in the belly? Did the daddy talk to the belly at all? Hello there, son. I want you to play left field. Work on that arm, buddy. 
right? And we kind of, we say, oh, well, that's just, that's just playful antics. That, that's not really, does it matter? Does it matter how soon we start teaching our children the truths of Jesus Christ? Do we need to wait till cradle rolls? How about high school? Should we wait then? After college, how soon does a mother have an opportunity to speak the words of truth to her baby? Paul tells Timothy, from your infancy, from your infancy, your mother and your grandmother were whispering into your ear, the truths of Jesus Christ. And those planted seeds in your heart that created a foundation and a root that have sprouted today, that have made you who you are. Eunice raised Timothy to be one who honors God. From infancy, she made sure her son knew the God of the Scriptures. And Timothy quickly recognized Christ in the character of Paul. That investment, that faith, that willingness to start early. Paul makes sure to mention the work of Lois in Timothy's life as well. A loving grandmother who passed on her faith and knowledge. And again, likely if, if, if dad had died, these two ladies had to bind together to, to survive in that world. Lois will forever be honored because of the faith that lived on in Timothy. I want you to think about something. When we all get to heaven, now, this is, this is, this is for free. This is bonus, okay? Uh, no charge for this, okay? Um, when we all get to heaven, we're going to meet wonderful, wonderful people. And we may recognize them without being told or what, but there's going to be some people who are going to say, hi, I'm so-and-so. We're going to say, ah, if only I, so who are you? Oh, I'm Noah's wife. Really? Oh, Grandma, you. wonderful. I didn't know, Right? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm so-and-so. Oh, really? who, who, you're so, well, who are you? I was the woman at the well. You were? That's amazing. I'm so glad to meet you. But I want you to know, when we get to heaven and someone reaches out their hand and says, hi, I'm Lois, you'll be able to say, I know you. You're Grandma Lois. You help Timothy. Hi, I'm Eunice. Are you, are you the Eunice? Yes, I'm, I'm the Eunice. You're Timothy's mom. Their names are there because of the great work they did. And they are honored for that work. And every mother and grandmother who follows in that footsteps should be honored and celebrated as well. Their names should not be forgotten. Their names are vital and important. Imagine how different the New Testament story would have been without Timothy. He was the son of a son to Paul, source of great relief and joy for the apostle. Timothy served as preacher, pastor, servant, missionary to the infant church, and he learned to trust in God from mom and from grandma. It's never too early to teach our children about God. It's never too early. And it's never too late either. Not that children don't make decisions, but if you haven't started yet, you can still start now. Amen? Don't give up. Don't give up. God bless the moms and grandmas who make the choice from infancy to begin teaching their children and grandchildren about the salvation that is to be found in Jesus Christ. I hope you do wonderful things for mom tomorrow. I hope that you do wonderful things to honor her memory, her investment her love, whether she's far away, whether she's with you, or anything you can do just to say thank you for your moms. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what a blessing it is to have the family that we have. We love our dads. We love our spouses and our children. We love everyone who invests into our lives and our relationships. But there's something very special about our moms, even on the cross, Lord, you showed compassion for your earthly mom. And Lord, you give us these other stories. They may not be as prominent. They may not be as dramatic as other stories in the Bible. But when we see even these little mentions of, of a mom and grandma like Lois and Eunice, it's there for a reason. And it's something that 
gives us inspiration and gives us courage. Thank you, Lord, for our moms. Thank you for our grandmas, our great grandmas. Help us, Lord, in this very, very challenging time to be able to contribute to the sincere faith of our children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.